Welcome to our evening service here at Bible Baptist Church. Of course, uh, old-fashioned night. Let's get started with number, number 453, the old-fashioned way. You can go ahead and stand up. Find your place there in your hymn book, number 453. They call me old-fashioned because I believe that the Bible is God's holy word. That Jesus who lived among men long ago is divine and the Christ of God. My sin was old-fashioned, my guilt was old-fashioned, God's love was old-fashioned, I know. And the way I was saved was the old-fashioned way through the blood that makes whiter than snow. Old-fashioned because I believe and accept only what has been spoken from heaven. Old-fashioned because at the cross I was saved, at the cross had my sins forgiven. My sin was old-fashioned, my guilt was old-fashioned, God's love was old-fashioned, I know. And the way I was saved was the old-fashioned way Through the blood that makes whiter than snow Old-fashioned because I am bound to do right To walk in the straight, narrow way because I have given my whole life to God, old fashioned because I pray. My sin was old fashioned, my guilt was old fashioned, God's love was old fashioned, I know. And the way I was saved was the old-fashioned way through the blood that makes whiter than snow. Old-fashioned because I am looking above to Jesus, my glorified Lord. Because I believe he is coming again Fulfilling his holy word Was old-fashioned, my guilt was old-fashioned God's love was old-fashioned, I know And the way I was saved was the old-fashioned way Through the blood that makes whiter than snow Welcome to Bible Baptist Church tonight. Good to have you in your places. Our old-fashioned service, we always enjoy this time of year. Hey, it's good to embrace old-fashioned uh, roots, amen? The word old-fashioned, the world uh, terms that definition obsolete. And, uh, but to us, it's not obsolete. It's what we hold to. It's what we ought to be grounded in. And so we take some time and have a good time uh, with that tonight. And I'm glad that you're here to enjoy it with us. Um, Brother Avery always takes that um, trying to see how far back it could go in era. I think last year um, he was a medieval knight or something. I think probably next year he might go back to Goliath, uh, Philistine, or something to that nature. And um, um, no, no. What what we need to be careful though. What we need to be careful. Th those guys back then they were like cannibals or and, and things, weren't they? Y'all watch out. Don't shake hands with some people tonight, all right? Just got to watch out. Um, let's open up in a word of prayer this evening, and then we'll give a few announcements. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness to us, Lord. Thank you for your people being able to have a good time together with one another in God's house. And, Lord, uh, what, a, what a great time we have as a family, a church family. 
Lord, we ask you please bless uh, the activities tonight. Lord, most importantly, the preaching of your word that you'd speak to our hearts. And then also, Lord, the meal that we'll enjoy some fellowship and food over. And uh, Lord, the shaking hands one with another, the singing your praises. May all be done to your honor, to your glory. And uh, Lord, I'd ask that we take some time uh, today, this week, to reflect about the many, uh, many different blessings you've poured on our life and to be thankful for that. We'll give you thanks and glory for what you do in our hearts and lives tonight. We ask this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you can remain standing because we'll sing a song in just a minute, but we want to recognize some visitors. Brother Steve, you had a guest with you back there. Mac, wonderful. Good to have you tonight. And Steve met Mac this afternoon, and it's good to have him in church tonight. Amen. Good to have you, brother. Um, any other visitors tonight to recognize? Nice hat, Tim. <laughs> Any other visitors on this side? All right, all the rest, home folk. A few announcements I uh, want to keep in mind. I have a bulletin somewhere here. There we go. Uh, the Wednesday night service is moved to Tuesday night this week. I will have testimonies and praises. Come with a testimony about how God, good God has been in your life, and then come with a hymn uh, that uh, is a favorite that we can sing on that evening as well. It starts at 7 o'clock this coming Tuesday. Uh, gym night next Sunday night. Second Milers lunch, all those 50 and above. We have our second Milers uh, lunch on the 10th of December at 1 p.m., and then Christmas cantata coming up later in December, so keep those things in mind. If you would, tonight's the last night to have Thanksgiving baskets turned in, and so if you have anything that you want to give towards Thanksgiving baskets monetary uh, money-wise, uh, make sure to turn that in and mark it accordingly. Um, just out of curiosity, that smell of kerosene is really strong. Is that bothering anybody out there? What's that? It's pretty stout. It's pretty stout. All right, we'll blow those out for you, try to give you some relief there, all right? Why don't we go ahead and take our song books, we'll turn to another song, and we'll get around and shake some hands after that. Brother Morse? Number 45, we'll sing the first verse there. It's Still the Blood, hymn number 45. Once I wandered in sin's black night And there was no way I could make my wrongs right Then that old accuser to the Lord did cry He is a sinner and now he must die And it's still the blood that saves from sin Still the blood of Jesus 
45. Let's start singing on that second verse, verse number two. Praise the Lord, it's still the blood, amen? We're going to do this. We're going to take an offering in just a moment. And uh, anyone need an uh, offering envelope for the Thanksgiving offering? You don't have one and you'd like one to, be, to give in that area? Anybody at all? Okay, but, okay a few ushers. Um, Greg, if you wouldn't mind running back there. And when he gets back in here, if you'd raise your hand again so he knows who needs one. And uh, often... I think just about every year we've taken this time also and given away uh, just a couple of thank yous to some folks that volunteer in some areas. And, uh, of course, God's house is not run uh, or does not go on just by a pastor's work. It's by a group of people that uh, labor and uh, many times put a lot of labor and effort and time into the work and ministry. And over the years, we've recognized some of those uh, just to say thank you, um, not, not to try to take from any heavenly rewards, amen, uh, but to recognize hard work and labor of the Lord, and we appreciate that around here. And so we want to give a few thank yous tonight, and uh, the first thank you I'd like to give tonight is, um, Miss Peggy, are you here? Peggy Sidney, where are you at? Miss Peggy, I know you love standing up in front of everybody, and why don't you come down if you wouldn't mind, and let's give Miss Peggy a hand. Some... Some of you don't know, Miss Peggy volunteers every week. She comes in, does the prayer bulletins and other office work, and does that voluntarily every week, just keeping things running in the office, being a help to Miss Beth Malinek in there. And just want to give you a thank you, Miss Peggy, for helping out in that area. And we appreciate that. And I, I think I stole your gift from in there too, Miss Peggy. Daniel, would, would you give? A little gift card you can spoil your husband with, amen? <laughs> uh, and the, the second one that we have tonight, I um, wanted to say thank you to somebody uh, that's also very special to our church in a, in a, a very real way. And uh, Miss Denise Johnson is our nursery director, and we appreciate the work that she does in the nursery. Uh, being a nursery director is not an envied job. If anyone wants a spotlight, that's not the spotlight they're looking for. And she works long hours and uh, dealing with uh, issues in there. And we appreciate Mrs. Johnson's work and being able to keep the babies out of the service so that we can listen in the service. Amen. And let's give Mrs. Johnson a hand if we would. Did we get those Thanksgiving offering envelopes passed out? Wonderful. Why don't we go ahead and pray for the offering tonight and ask God's hand a blessing upon it. Daniel, why don't you pray and uh, ask God's blessing on the offering tonight.
this at this time. If we have some young people uh, that dressed up for Old Fashioned Day, we're going to have you come forward if you'd like to be involved in the contest tonight. So if you are 18 or under, 18 or under, and want to come up to the front here uh, at this time, if you dressed up for Old Fashioned Service, uh, you come on up. And we have a gift card that uh, we have for the best dressed old fashioned young person. Here they come. Well, we're doing that while the young people are coming up. I believe there's a couple of ladies in the nursery uh, that participated. Do we have one or two ladies that would sneak back into the nursery? Miss Rebecca, Miss Patty, thank you. If you'd swap out with them. And then I have some judges. Uh, we got two up here. Miss Beth Malinek, where are you at? You're coming up here. All right. Any other young people? Do we have any others? Cabo George, you're going to take a pass on it? Last chance here. All right. We got all the young people up here. Don't shoot us all there, Reuben. That gun's pointing right at your pastor's head right now. <laughs> Brother Morris, I'm going to let you take over right here so I don't get shot. We'll give our judges a couple minutes to look and uh, see what they're going to do. We got a song, a verse of a song that we could sing as they uh, sit there and try to make a call on the winning kid tonight. Do you want me to go a cappella? Uh, we'll sing that one. All right. 495, brethren, we have met to worship. 495. have a winner. Reuben. Give Reuben a hand. Good job, buddy. And the cowboy. Reuben, if you'll come right over here, buddy. All right. Good job, kiddo. Thanks for dressing up tonight. You go have a seat. Make sure you share with that little sister of yours. Give her one, give her one French fry out of that. All right. Do we have some adults tonight? Go ahead. Go have a seat. Go have a seat. Caleb, quit trying to take over the service. <laughs> He's lost as can be right now. Thank you, Miss Shelley. I appreciate it. All right. We have some couples or singles, anyone adult-wise, though. If uh, you dressed up tonight and want to participate, you come on down. I'll come down with you. All right, Brother Daryl. I think we have one more couple we're waiting on. The Barneys, all right. We're waiting on the We're going to exclude them because they've won the last few years, and we don't want to wait for them anyways, right? <laughs> All right, Brother Morris, we'll, we'll wait for them to come in. Judges, we have one more couple still coming, I believe. Um, but we're going to go ahead and sing a stanza or two of a song, Brother Morris. I hope you saved your place there at 495. We'll do that second verse there. Brethren, we have met to worship, 495. Brethren, see for sinners round you. Yeah. 
Do you need another verse? Uh, no, oh, yeah. All right. So we'll do another verse there. Verse number three. Sisters, will you join and help us? Pose a sister. This may go into overtime here. Let's do that last verse, number four. Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all things new. Then hell call us home to heaven. Good job, Barney's. Here you go. Hey, good job. Good, good effort into that. I want to see how those kids look as Philistines, though, next year. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thanks for your participation tonight. Good time in God's house. If you can't have a good time in God's house, where can you have a good time, right? If you've got to go to the world uh, to have a good time, uh, then just something's wrong with you there. We're going to go ahead and do this. We have a, a special tonight, and then after that special... Uh, we'll have a message, and want to try to get you to some turkey out there. How many are hungry tonight? I just wanted to see what I was up against as I was preaching. And so we'll, we'll have a word of prayer, and as I'm praying special, if you'll get ready, and then we'll get in the message. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to open your word. Lord, thank you for giving us the word of God. It's inspired, it's preserved, it can be trusted. Thank you for the truths of in it. Lord, may we seek to hand those truths down from generation to generation. Lord, as we look back and have this old-fashioned service tonight, we think of uh, the many generations that have gone before us and have stuck to the book. May we continue to do that in our lives and in our families and pass that down to the next generation. We ask that you please bless the message now to come in a little bit. May you speak to our hearts through it. We ask that you please be with the special in music. Use it for your honor, for your glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. For making the sun to shine, putting the stars in the sky, for the flowers that bloom, the ocean so blue, thank you, Lord, for every sparrow that sings and can make sweet melody for rivers that flow the rain and the snow thank you lord i just want to thank you lord i just want to thank you lord for everything you've done for me thank you lord i just want to thank you lord i just want to thank you lord for saving my soul making me whole thank you lord For my home and family, for life's joys that you've given me, for shoes on my feet, plenty to eat, thank you, Lord. For this church where I worship and pray, for 
the freedoms I have today, sweet spirit, I feel your presence so real. Thank you, Lord, for being a friend so dear, giving my sad heart cheer. For holding my hand when I could not stand. Thank you, Lord, for giving your life for me on a cross of Calvary. For taking my place, mercy and grace, thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for me. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord, for saving my soul, making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul, making me whole. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Enjoyed that. Amen. I remember growing up, I had an uncle that looked awfully, a, a, a lot like you, Brother Austin. Not face-wise, but how you're dressed tonight. I don't know if it has anything to do with that era. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 23. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 23 in our Bibles tonight. Find your place. If you would, we'll read this passage of Scripture, and we'll jump into the message I believe God would have for us tonight. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 23. You there? All right, let's look at it. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Lord, we ask that you please bless the message tonight. We ask that you speak to our hearts through your word. Lord, we ask that you please keep any distraction away that would pull us from focusing on the word of God tonight and the message that you have for us. Lord, and may we pay attention and uh, listen. And I'd ask that you please use me uh, to deliver the message in a way that you would want to be done. May you speak to our hearts and challenge us, God, tonight as Christians. If there is any here tonight that do not know Christ as their Savior, uh, they've never had a time in their life where they've been born again, may they settle that tonight, God. Please strengthen us in our faith that we would hold fast to it. Lord, without wavering, uh, we have a faithful God that has given us many promises. If we'd hold fast to that faith, uh, Lord, may we be faithful to do so. Please uh, speak to us now, God. We ask this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to speak tonight on, on the subject, the, the truth of thanksgiving. And you say, how does that fit hand in hand with the passage that we're looking tonight? I, I believe I can tie the two in together. Unfortunately, liberalism has really watered down and even erased or covered over the true story of what thanksgiving is. Uh, in public education, like much of our history, uh, the history of Thanksgiving has been watered down or revised, if you want to call it. A big thing today is revisionist history. Let's make history to be what we want it to be rather than what history actually was. And they've done the same with Thanksgiving, where history is no longer the true history of what it was. History books describe Thanksgiving Day as a day where the pilgrims had a festival, much like the festivals in Europe, uh, to thank the Indians and Mother Nature uh, for the summer that they had completely living out anything regarding God and God's role in what God did for them. It's, a, it's, it's no surprise that the world, secularism, kicks out God out of education. And they've done that for the last number of years, and they'll continue to do that. I, I looked on studying and, and looking out, okay, what is Thanksgiving Day? I went on History Channel's website. And what is the History Channel? Because every, no, everybody knows History Channel always gives pure historic facts, right? 
And so if I want something accurate, I could go to the History Channel and find out. I pulled up the History Channel. The first Thanksgiving that the pilgrims had. What is it about? It's about the type of food they ate and the people that were there. Totally absent of, of God being anywhere in the Thanksgiving story. And, and that's the world that we live in today, where God is left out of thanksgiving. Even if there is this matter of thanks towards people, God is not a part of it. The world today completely skips over the recognition of thanksgiving. It's, it's any longer turkey day. It's football day. It's who's going to play on the big screen. Marketing has successfully made thanksgiving into national shopping day. It's amazing. It, you know, it used to be, and, and it comes a little bit closer every year, it used to be day after Thanksgiving, that's a day to hit the stores and get ready for Christmas. And it crept up to midnight, you're going out, and now, now it's Thanksgiving Day, where employees can't spend time with their families and spend some time giving thanks around the table. They've got to be in a store checking out items somewhere because Christmas is coming. But that's not by accident. That's a secular world that we live in. It's important for us to understand our history. Understand our roots. Understand where we came from. Christian, it's important that we have a proper foundation. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If we don't understand our history, our true history, we're destined for failure in the future. And that's where we're at today. So who were the pilgrims when we talk about this matter of thanksgiving, going back to our roots a little bit, going back uh, to, to old fashioned? Who were the pilgrims? Why did they travel to America? After losing half of their colony, the first winter that they were here, what in the world did they have to give thanks over? I mean, they had more graves than they did huts built. What difference should it make in our life? I want to answer a few of those questions tonight through the message. Let me, I want to start by distinguishing who the pilgrims were. Uh, you've heard terms of separatists and puritans. How many have heard the term puritan before? Okay. How many have heard the term separatist before? A lot of times we, we don't understand the difference between Puritan and Separatist. The pilgrims were Separatists, although they were not known as pilgrims until about the 1800s. Um, that term goes back, they were Separatists that came over here. The Puritans were people inside the Anglican Church, the Church of England. It was a state church. Everyone in England had to be part of the state church, the state religion. The Puritans within wanted to purify that church. They saw the error of the church, and they said, we need to make things right, but we don't want to come out. We want to stay within and make it right. Uh, for instance, let's say somebody became born again and wanted to try to reform the Catholic church. Not a whole lot of shot of doing that, right? Once something go, uh, goes sour, it's hard to bring it back. You've got to start afresh and anew. The separatists, on the other hand, uh, they also saw the error of the state church. They believed Catch this, they believe that the church should be compromised of or comprised of believers, a group of believers, not just anybody and everybody, not a nation, but born-again believers. They believe it ought to be governed uh, by believers, uh, by the local church. Uh, the state shouldn't decide who the pastor is going to be. Amen. And that's biblical there. And the separatists said, we're rejecting this national idea of a state church. We believe in an independent church. We believe in a congregation full of believers we reject infant baptism, amen? Baptizing your babies doesn't do anything for them. It doesn't wash any sins away. They rejected that idea. In fact, a lot of their doctrine uh, and, and persuasion, they were influenced heavily by the Anabaptists. Anabaptists were our forefathers. And so they, they had a lot of influence given by our Baptist forefathers and, and a lot of uh, similarities between the two. Uh, of course, as a result of coming out from the church of England, they faced heavy persecution. If you weren't involved in that church, they were going after you. Heads were rolling. They weren't too happy about that. So the separatists, in facing this heavy persecution for breaking away, um, in holding to the doctrines of the Word of God, heard there's religious freedom in Holland. So 1608, they decide they're going to flee over to Holland. They're going to enjoy this religious freedom over there. They travel to Holland with their kids and their families. It's amazing. They uproot everything. Think about this. They uproot everything because we want to worship our God as we're supposed to from the Bible and raise our families that way. Now, think about this, Christian. How much would you sacrifice to raise your family how you see fit from the Word of God? How much are you willing to give up to say, I want to raise my family how God wants me to raise my family? They were separatists, separating out. They were willing to sacrifice some things. They go to Holland, and 12 years in Holland, all of a sudden they begin to realize the influences, the world, the influences in Holland, although we have freedom to worship, 
these worldly influences are affecting our kids. Our kids are getting robbed by the world here. They're going into the world. We don't want that. Remember, they were separatists. Baptists could use that consideration a little bit. Amen? There was a day where the Baptists would consider, hey, what kind of influence is the world going to have on my child? And if it's a wrong influence, I'm not letting them around that influence. I'm pulling them out. I'm separating. There was a day where the Baptists believed that separation was a good thing. We've come a long way today, haven't we? You walk in the average Baptist church today, and there's nothing to do with separation. We have grace. What do we need separation for? I didn't say isolation. I said separation. The worldliness going on in children today, we ought to be opposed to that. Hebrews chapter 10, our text this evening says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. God in our text tonight tells us, I want you to hold fast to that profession of faith. I was telling a story a few weeks ago. We were talking about that, that term, hold fast, if I remember right, and telling a story about a pilot who had fallen out of, of the, the back door of the plane. And he was holding fast onto that plane as it was, uh, uh, I forget, I think 4,000 feet up in the air, something crazy like that, until it landed. And they had to pry his fingers apart off of that plane, uh, holding fast. God says, I want you to hold fast to the profession of your faith. Hold fast to your faith. Hold fast, fast to the truths of the Word of God, the principles of the Word of God. What does Proverbs say? 23 verse 23 says, buy the truth and sell it not. What is he saying there? Hold fast to truth. Hold fast to the truths, the doctrines of God, amen, of Jesus Christ, of the Bible, that it's the word of God. Don't change what you believe because society believes different. Don't change how your family stands because society preaches a different truth. Somebody once said, he that stands for nothing will fall for anything. And if you have no stands in your life, you'll end up falling for some ridiculous things in your life. And let us not compromise our faith is what he's saying. Don't compromise. Interesting. Look back at that verse again, though. He says, let us hold fast. He doesn't say just our faith, but the profession of our faith. That word profession, what does that mean? It means public declaration. What declares our faith publicly? Think about it, Christian. What declares your faith publicly to the world? There's a few ways you can declare that faith publicly to the world. First of all, you can confess it with your mouth, amen? That's our witness, our testimony of Christ. Jesus Christ saved me. I'm a Christian. This is what he's done for me. I can confess with my mouth. I'm not on the ground. Look up here now tonight. We can confess with our mouth. Uh, the second way is our conduct. How can I uh, profess my faith through the way that I live? Through the way that I live, Christian. The world looks at me and they're saying, is he a Christian or is he not a Christian? Others ought to be able to look at us and see a difference. Far too many times a Christian walks in a grocery store, goes to work, lives in his neighborhood. Nobody ever can tell a difference between him and the lost. We live in a dark world today. <laughs> we, we live where sin abounds. The life of the Christian ought to definitely shine out as something different and something bright. So he can confess, but also his conduct can, can show, hey, this is my faith. His appearance can show, hey, this is my faith, amen? It's a profession of faith. Who knows you're a Christian by what you say, how you live, and how you act? It's a good question. Are you willing to let your profession of faith go to get ahead in life? That's what we're doing in today's day and time. Well, I've got to get ahead in my job. I've got to get my kids ahead in life. I'm willing to let some professions of faith go to jump ahead. Is it worth that risk? This group of men and women would not discard their faith. We're talking about old-fashionedism tonight. We're talking about uh, our forefathers' Thanksgiving. There's a group of separatists that said, yeah, we don't care the sacrifice. We're not going to discard our faith. We're not going to discard the profession of our faith. We want to pass it down. What does the Bible say? Come out from among them and be ye... Separate. Don't be like them. Be separate. From who? The world. We ought to be separate from the world. He says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Don't be like this world, but be completely different. Now, this isn't only in doctrine. Yes, we're supposed to be different from the world in doctrine, but that's an obvious. If I, if I trusted Christ as my Savior, my doctrine is different from the world. 
So when he's talking about this matter of confirmation, not being conformed or adopting this world, he's not talking about doctrine there. What is he talking about? He's talking about practice. I shouldn't be conformed in my practices in life to this world, but be transformed, be completely different. Confirmation's not talking about doctrine. It's talking about our language there. He's talking about our dress there. He's talking about the structures of our homes there. He, he's talking about submission in our life to authority there. He's talking about attitude there. He says we're supposed to be different. That didn't get a whole lot of amens there. There was a day where you talked about those things in a Baptist church, and it was, hey, pastor, we're for you. We ought to be different. But today it's, no, I don't want to stand out as different. What is he talking about? Be not conformed to this world. That's a Christian. He's talking to the Christian there. We ought to be different from this world. Hold fast to the profession of that faith. Be different. Be willing to stand out, not just in doctrine, but in practice in the way that we live. Parent, is there a concern that your child will turn out like the world? Because there ought to be that concern. I'm afraid sometimes as parents, today the concern is, I don't want them to stand out different from the world. I want them to blend in. I don't, I don't want them to be sticking out like a sore thumb among all their friends that are lost. That's our problem. We want them to blend in with the rest of the world. How are you going to raise a child for God when you want them to blend in and be like the rest of the world? It's impossible. These pilgrims were willing to pick up and move everything that they had for the sake of holding on to their faith and passing down that faith to the next generation. I call that dedication. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Christian, are you dedicated to that faith? Is your family dedicated to that faith? What sacrifice are you willing to make to hold on to that faith? Young person, what sacrifice are you willing to make to hold on to that faith that's been given to you? What sacrifice? In 1620, so they're there in Holland for 12 years, and after 12 years, they figure out, this is not good for our kids. This is, this is going to ruin their faith. So 1620, they decide, we need to leave Holland. We need to go look for freedom somewhere else. And, and of course, they look at America and say, that's a place for us. That's where we need to be. So 50 of these pilgrims made the uh, voyage on the Mayflower to America. They left Holland. They spent 65 days on this small little boat Meager rations, uncomfortable living. Their biscuits that they were eating from, they literally have to break them open with hammers and eat on them. Just the conditions were wretched conditions. <laughs> it's amazing what they went through to hold on to that faith. It just floors me. Uh, the pilgrims arrived at Cape Cod. They signed the Mayflower Compact. And on December 23rd, 1620, began to set up camp in the snowy, frigid conditions. They're at Cape Cod. I've been there before, right on the coast there. They began to try to set up huts and, and, and bury in for the winter time. No food. I mean, they just came on this voyage, have nothing left, uh, trying to make it through winter. That first winter was awfully tough for them. But to them, it was worth it. We we're going to hold on to our faith. We we're going to make a place that our kids can thrive, our faith can thrive. That first winter, 18 out of the 18 wives that came with, 14 of them perished. Think about that. Four, four of the wives made it through that first winter. Half of the population died. There were seven times more graves than there were huts. But the pilgrims clung to their faith. The Mayflower returned back to England. Not one pilgrim stepped back on that board, or stepped back on board to go back to England. We're not doing it. Yeah, it's been tough. Yeah, it's been a sacrifice. Yeah, there's been some difficulties that we've gone through. But let us hold fast to the faith. What does the rest of that verse say? Without wavering. We're not going to waver. We're not going to go back and forth. We're not going to give up. That word waver means to fluctuate. It means to be unsettled, to move back and forth in our faith. One minute, God is great, and the next minute, we're doubting God's goodness. Uh, uh, yesterday, you decided, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to give God my life. I'm going to be faithful to him. And then today, it's too difficult to live right. I just can't do it. Uh, that's wavering in our faith. He says, hold fast that profession and waver not. God never said, listen now, Christian, God never said that living right was going to be easy. He never said that. But living right is easier in the long run than living a life of transgression. Because the way of the transgressor is hard when it all catches up. He never said today it's going to be simple to make right decisions. He never said it's going to be a cakewalk to choose what is right, uh, right here and right now. 
What it takes to do that which is right is sometimes difficult, but it is still right. Raising your family for the Lord might be difficult, but don't waver. Don't waver on it. Trusting God through the difficulties might be difficult at times, but don't waver. He's saying, hold fast to that faith. We live in such a wimpy society today. There's no backbone. There's no, I'm going to grab onto this and just hang on. The smallest wind many times blows over the average Christian. That's why our president is such a shock to our society. I'm not saying he's holding fast on everything that which is right. But man, that guy holds fast to something. He doesn't back down because there's some adversity. And society is like, what, what in the world? Politics, this is supposed to run this guy over. And here he is holding fast to what he said he was going to do. Oh, that we had some Christians that would hold fast and say, this is what's right from the book. I don't care the direction the world's going. I don't care how my kids try to push one way or the other way. I'm going to stick to what the book says. I'm going to stick to the way God tells me to raise my family to live. Don't waver in your confession of Christ. Don't waver in your conduct for Christ. Don't waver in your appearance for Christ. Don't language in your speech for Christ. Don't waver. Don't waver. Sometimes we get a hangnail and we want to quit. Oh, what was me? There was a guy I was talking to this week I had coffee with. And he's up there in years. I was asking him about life. What some things that he had gone through in life. He told me about an instance he had lost his job. He had a good, good paying job. Lost his job. Looking everywhere for a job. He had his family, his kids, two kids. I believe two kids in Christian school. And uh, trying to make it through. Faithful in church. Good godly Christian man. Loses his job. God, that's not fair. God knows what he's doing. And God ends up giving him a job down in the Linton area. Well, where he lived at the time was quite a distance. They have one vehicle. His kids are in Christian school, and they've got to drive about 40 minutes to get to the Christian school. So he leaves his car back home with his wife, and during the week, he's down in Linton, has to walk seven miles to work there, seven miles back home from work after working 12 hours that day. Did that every day. In wintertime, got there, seven hours there, seven hours back walking. He said, Pastor, I didn't think anything about it. I, I had, to, had to work a job. I had to provide for my family. They needed the car. I wasn't going to take the car from them. I wasn't going to take my kids out of school where they needed to be. I, I was going to do what was right, and we just worked through it. Today, you get a young man with the family do that. They throw up their hands and quit. It's just it's too hard. Can't do it. Dig in, get something about you that says we can make this through, we can work this through. I'm not going to let go of all that God has for me, all that God wants me to be. I'm going to stick with this, hold fast, without wavering. What's too tough for you, Christian? What is too tough for you? What, to what extent is it just too hard? It's too hard, God. Why do these pilgrims hold fast through all that they went through? It was their faith. Their faith. Our faith is important to us, and we're going to hold on to it. How important is our faith to us? Man, that's convicting looking at the life of the pilgrims. We're not talking about, yeah, some Indians and pilgrims got together, they ate a turkey. We're talking about this real, real Thanksgiving Day celebration. What was it about? Some pilgrims, some separatists, some Christians that had a real faith in God that moved them to action and said, hey, no, nothing is too far for us to hold on to that faith. Our faith is important to us. What gets between us and our faith? What do we allow to get in there and drive a wedge between us and God? Us and godly living. Us and holiness. Us and our witness. Story goes on. Springtime came. They, hard, hard winter. Many of them died off. Springtime came, though, in 1621. God brought an Indian by the name of, you know him. Oh, maybe you don't know him. What's his name? Squanto, right? Um, you thought he was a fairy tale, didn't you? No, he's, he was a real... A real man. God brought this man named Squanto to the pilgrims. Now, Squanto was God's providence. Listen now. In 1614, there was a man by the name of Captain Thomas Hunt that came to the Americas. And they were among the Indians. He captured Indians. He took them back to England, Squanto being one, and sold those Indians into slavery there in England. There was a monk that bought Squanto. He set him free. He taught him English, and he taught him about Christ. Now, I don't know what to extent he taught him about Christ being a monk, but no doubt he heard about Christ according to history. He, he, um, he was there in England for 
five years, 1619, he ended up going back to America one year before the pilgrims would settle on Cape Cod. He goes back to his area. His whole village had been killed off. The, the uh, settlers, when they had come over, had spread the, the, I believe it was a smallpox disease, and it killed off his whole village. And so he ended up staying and in, in, in settling with another Indian tribe there just a year before the settlers came. That springtime comes, God sends them this, this, this Indian, Squanto, who already knew English, who had experienced England, who knew of Christ and was very friendly towards them, taught them how to cook, uh, taught them how to trap, taught them how to plant, all that stuff so they can make it through. In fact, William Bradford, governor of Plymouth, wrote that Squanto was a special instrument sent of God for good beyond our expectations. It's amazing. God had plans. I mean, seven years prior, back in 1614, God in his providence said, hey, let me take this little Indian guy and move him over to England, prepare him, because I have some Christians coming over that are going to need some help. That's just amazing, the providence of God. You know, we have a God that orchestrates beyond any, any ability out there. He sees the future. He knows what we're going to go through. God provides. We just have to trust him. And Squanto sat there and he taught the pilgrims how to grow corn and use fertilizer and stalk deer and catch fish. They would have never survived that next winter without him. You know, the Bible says that the last part of that verse that we just read, it says, for us to hold fast to that profession of faith without wavering, for he, who is he? God. Our God is faithful, that promised. Oh, we have a faithful God. If I hold fast onto this faith, if I make my faith first, is that, am I really going to win out in the end? We have a God that is faithful. Psalm 34, verse 22 says, The Lord redeemeth the soul of his saints, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. God has never forsaken the righteous. I, I, I've been uh, young and now I'm old, yet I've I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. David said, God is a faithful God. He was faithful for the pilgrims way back then. And let me remind you, that story reminds us of his faithfulness today in our lives. If I hold fast to my faith, the profession of my faith, if I'll make it first, God's not going to be debtor to us. The song was written, great is thy faithfulness. O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt beat. The same God that was faithful to Abraham, he was faithful to Isaac and the promises that he made, he was faithful to Jacob, he was faithful to David, and on the line goes, is faithful to you and I. Summer time brought great provision, and in the autumn of 1621, the first Thanksgiving was celebrated. Not a day of giving thanks to Mother Nature. Not even a day of giving thanks to the Indians, although they did invite them. There was 90 Indians there, and I'm sure they were very appreciative. But the focus of that day was an appreciation for God. It was a day of giving thanks to God for his thankfulness and for his provision. A celebration of what God had done. And, and remember, now we talked about it this morning, adversities and trials, we are still to give thanks, are we not? Now put yourself in these pilgrim shoes for a second, and I'm wrapping it up here. Not a year ago, 14 out of 18 wives had died. Husbands had died. Children had died. It hasn't even been a year, a year, and they've lost many loved ones, but they understand, hey, it's time to give thanks. God has been good to us. Once again, seeing God's grace even in adversity. Thanksgiving is to be given in all circumstances. Two years later, they would once again celebrate that time of Thanksgiving to God, and their governor, William Bradford, wrote this. And as much as a great father hath given us this year an abundant harvest of Indian corn, wheat, peas, beans, squashes, garden vegetables, not carrots, and has made the forest to abound with game and the sea with fish and clams, and as much as he has protected us from the ravages of the savages, has spared us from pestilence and disease, has granted us freedom to worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience. Now I, your magistrate, do proclaim that all ye pilgrims, with your wives and ye little ones, do gather at ye meeting house on ye hill between the hours of 9 and 12 in the, day, uh, in the daytime on Thursday, November 29th of the year of our Lord, 1623, and the third year since ye pilgrims landed on ye pilgrim rock, there to listen to ye pastor and render thanksgiving to ye almighty God for his blessings." 
He said, hey, let's gather at the church house. Let's hear some preaching. And let's give thanks to our God for what he's done. That's what Thanksgiving was about. The story of pilgrims portrays the truth we see in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful, that promise. Hey, Christian, hold fast. Hold fast to that faith in our life. Hold fast to that declaration of faith, to that holy living that is supported by that faith. And don't waver. Don't waver. Don't change when times are difficult. Don't quit serving God when times are tough. God is faithful. God will reward his servants that hold on to this, their faith. In 1623, God continued to bless their settlement. In fact, they moved, they started off with this communal type setup where they all had one garden, all worked in that garden. And William Bradford had this great idea of let's give private land and they can all work on their own gardens. And God blessed that the American way there, right? It's amazing how, how God has a setup already in mind. In the 1930s, he brings the Massachusetts Bay Colony there, which brings even more uh, life and, and thriving to the colony. There, God is debtor to no man. Here, these pilgrims move all the way around the world because we need to hold on to our faith. And God says, hey, I'll make sure I reward you. There, there are many changing today, but hold fast to your faith. That term old-fashioned, it means obsolete. And that's how the world looks at our old-fashioned church, our old-fashioned standards, our old-fashioned King James Bible, our old-fashioned preaching. They look at an obsolete Bible, obsolete standards, obsolete preaching. Hold fast. What are you willing to sacrifice to hold on to that which we ought to have? Some of you young people, you have parents that are sacrificing a whole lot to hold on to that faith and pass it down. There's a story that I read about a mother and a child down in Florida. And it was a summer day, a nice hot summer day, and, and the, the child, the boy, wanted to go out and go swimming. There was a back pond in the house or outside of the house. And on that hot day, he ran out that back door, jumped into that pond, all excited to take a dip in the swimming pond back there. Mom looked out the window. She saw there was an alligator in that pond. And she realized... Boy swimming towards alligator, alligator coming towards the shore. Bad, bad, uh, bad equation there. And so she goes running out the door, starts yelling at that boy, come back, come back, don't go that way. He hears mom and he realizes, hey, I better turn around, and he starts swimming back towards the shore. But it was too late of time, and the alligator caught up. Just as mom grabs a hold of his arms, that alligator snaps his legs into its, its mouth, and she's pulling with all her might. Just not, there's no comparison of strength. But she had some great passion there pulling on him, not willing to give up on her boy and digging her, her, uh, her nails into his arms, trying to save his life at all costs. And she's fighting and she's yelling. And there was a farmer driving by who heard the commotion and realized what was going on. He jumps out of his truck with his shotgun. Praise the Lord for America where you can still do that, amen? It wasn't California or Illinois. And he goes in the back there and, and he, he aims at that alligator. He takes that alligator out. And they take that little boy, rush to the hospital. There for three weeks, he recovers in that hospital. She saved his life. The news reporters get to the hospital eventually after healing, and, and the story breaks loose. And they're just amazed at what happened. And they ask, can we see the scars? And he pulls up his pant leg on, on his leg, and they see the scars there. And just all, all in tears over what had happened. He said, but hold on, look at this. And he pulls up his sleeves, and he says, these are scars from my mom that wasn't willing to let go. She wasn't willing to let go. She wanted to save my life. Rather than having disdain and fighting those parents that are not letting you go, they're trying to hold on. Those authorities that are saying, hey, no, I want you to get this faith. Rather than disdaining and hating and despising what they're trying to do, why don't you have a love for them because they love you so much that they're not willing to let go? They're saying, no, I want them to get this. I want them to have that faith that is so wonderful. To experience the rewards that God gives to the faithful. Hey, Christian, hold fast to that faith. Hold fast to that profession of faith. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the challenge that you give us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Thank you for the pilgrims, Lord, many years ago, willing to hold fast on that faith, make some sacrifices, come here to America. 
that they might establish some freedoms to worship God. And Lord, here we are tonight, enjoying those same freedoms, being willing to worship God in, in our independent church with a bunch of believers that are holding fast to their profession. Lord, there's times where it's tough, and it seems like all we can do is let go of that faith. But God, may we determine in our hearts and in our lives that we're not going to let go. God, I pray that some young people would get this, that what their parents are trying to do is trying to pass down that faith to them. They care about their kids, just like the, the, the pilgrims did so many years ago. Lord, may, may they see that love and, and see it as love, God. I'd ask that, Lord, you'd raise up, Lord, a group of Christians that will pass it on to the next generation. There will be a remnant remaining in this dark world as it becomes even darker. Lord, please bless now invitation time as only you can. We ask for you to be honored and glorified for decisions to be made where they need to be made. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Anyone tonight, hold on piano, hold on. Anyone would say tonight, Pastor, I, I'm here tonight to be honest with you. I'm not sure that I'm going to heaven when I die. I don't know if I were to die tonight, I don't know where I would go, heaven or hell. Pastor, would you pray for me? I need Jesus Christ as my Savior. I need salvation. Pastor, would you pray for me? There's nobody looking around tonight, but between me and you and God, you say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven someday when I die. Would you pray for me, Pastor? You just raise your hand by way of testimony tonight saying, Pastor, I need to be saved. Would you pray for me? That's me tonight, Pastor. Anybody like that tonight? You'd raise your hand and say, that's me. I don't want to miss you tonight. Let me ask you tonight. You say, Pastor, God spoke to my heart through the message tonight, holding fast to that faith. God spoke to my heart tonight. Here's my hand. Just remember me in prayer if you would, Pastor. And Lord, you saw the hands that were raised. Thank you for speaking to hearts. Bless invitation time. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet as the music begins to play. God spoke to your heart. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Maybe, maybe some of us will recommit to holding fast to that faith, that profession. Just faith. as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee. Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot O Lamb of God I come I come just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without a lamb. Of God I come, I come. Just as I am, poor, wretched, blind, sight, rich as healing of the mind. Yea, all I need in thee to find all them of God I come, I come. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for how you spoke to our hearts. Lord, may we not allow the Word of God to uh, return void, but Lord, may we allow it to continue to work in our hearts and lives, even as we leave uh, service tonight.
Lord, please be with the one that's being dealt with about salvation tonight. May you work in their heart, help them to see their need for Christ. Please bless the fellowship now in the gym afterwards. May you bless the food to our bodies. We thank you for the hands that have prepared it and labored this afternoon uh, to bring it tonight. May you give us a great time around the table together. We love you. We ask this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. You could stay standing. We'll be dismissed in just a minute. And we have one being dealt with for salvation down here. And so please mind them if you would. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, we have a wonderful meal over in the gym planned for you. And we'd love for you to come and be a part of fellowship over there. And uh, we already prayed for the...